Okay, in our last session, I mentioned to you what makes a good story. So what's a good story? Ones that people read. That's right. Thank you, Rod. Ones that people read. The stories that people read are a good story. And so what I want to do right now is talk to you about questions that work in your interviews, um, how to go about conducting an interview, and uh, how you find a good story. You know, this is uh, Catherine. I mean, Katrina. Katrina just asked, sorry, Katrina just asked, how do you find a good story? Well, it's a good question. And the answer to that is, if you are interested in it, somebody else will be interested in it. If you find interest in a story that you're on, you go onto a scene somewhere and you think it's interesting, somebody else is going to think it's interesting. Bet on it, bank on it, write a story about it. Now, you may not get the largest audience in the world, but you will get somebody else who's interested in it and who will also be grateful that you wrote a story about it. And you can believe in your perspective as you do this. For instance, I was using the example of if you go to a Meals on Wheels opening and it's a ribbon cutting, and uh, you're, uh, what you see in front of you is, are five guys with the scissors and a big ribbon, and um, your story lead looks something like um, at, mm, the mayor and their staff cut the ribbon at the Meals and Wheels Center on Motor Drive at 3 o'clock Wednesday uh, for the new $14 million uh, food facility. Um, boring. No one's going to read it. No one cares. It's just awful. But if you're looking around at a scene like that and you're thinking, gee, this is boring, you can bet if you write a boring story, no one's going to read it. So look around for something that interests you. So in a situation like this, for instance, if you saw a girl standing at the edge of the a crowd and she's kind of got braided hair and a floppy hat and a peace sign and a paisley dress and, and you're wondering, she's out of place, everyone else is in business suits, what is she doing here? And you go up to her and say, may I ask you why you're here today? I'm a reporter. And she says, well, you know, there was a time in my life that I was really destitute and I was really in need and Meals on Wheels really helped me. Now, Meals on Wheels is an American uh, charity organization that takes food to people who don't have food. And so she said, I'm just here to pay my respects to this organization that really saved me. I'm very grateful they were here. Well, there's a good story. You know, Janice Sunflower stood on the edge of the crowd watching the ribbon being cut at Meals on Wheels on their new $14 million facility, full of gratitude that this organization helped her in a time of need. Count the words and see if it's 21 words. And there's your lead. Now, when you go on an interview, uh, even if you are in some remote country somewhere, and you don't think you're a journalist, um, but you're going to do a story, let me tell you that the people that you are doing the story on are a little bit nervous because they're not sure how you're going to portray them. Now, for those of you in other countries who have experience uh, doing interviews with the heads of organizations, let me give you a tip about <laughs> the heads of organizations. They, they are trained to uh, say, the five-minute spiel, the 10-minute spiel, the 15-minute spiel, and the one-minute spiel. And that's what they're going to give you when you get in front of them. And so uh, why do they do this? Because they're the heads of organizations, and they want to cast their organization in the best light. But are we advocates or, or are we reporters? Reporters. We're reporters. We're not advocates. So when they, when they give us a spiel, what do we do? Just let it go by. <laughs> Now you're going to have your notepad. I suggest you find a nice, comfortable chair, and you pick out your notepad, and you start writing on your notepad, and you hold your notes to, so they cannot see you what you're writing. And as they're giving you your one-minute spiel, or five-minute, you write your laundry list, or what I have to do later today. But you're writing something, and you're not making a lot of eye contact, but some eye contact, yes, I'm listening. But uh, you're not really writing anything of interest. And to the point where, when they're finally done, then you can finally have what I call a coffee conversation with the people. Envision yourself at Starbucks or some coffee shop somewhere where, gee, the day is done, and now we're just talking things over. So then you can start asking them real questions like, how did you get into this anyway? Why did you get into this? You know, why did you find this fascinating? What is it about this job that you're doing that really grabs your heart? What was the biggest disappointment you ever had in this? Um, who is um, your number one supporter? Does it, how does your family feel about you being involved in this? And all this personal stuff starts to come out. It's unrehearsed. And what we're aiming for is unrehearsed answers. Um, now, please write this down, everybody. I'm going to give you um, the best journalism question ever. This is the best question ever. 
And so don't fail to write this down. I'm telling you this ahead of time. And it's a gold question. And I want 10% of all the money you make off this question. <laughs> and I'll be set for the rest of my life. The question, though, is this. What have you never been asked? Is there anything? Well, let me say it two different ways. One way to say this question is, what would you like to say that I haven't asked you? And I have gotten probably, without exaggeration, 90% of my leads have come from this question. The very last question that I ask, after maybe an interviewing for an hour, comes from this question, what would you like to say that I haven't asked you? Because that comes straight from the heart. People stop what they're doing and they think. Now you video interview people, do the same thing. After your entire thing is shot, just sit there for a minute, don't worry about how much tape or digital space you're eating up. And just ask them the question, what would you like to say that I haven't asked you? Okay. Now here's another question. I was interviewing, um, <clears throat> this was a surprise interview. Um, I was told, um, I was in the newsroom one day, and the publisher came up to me and said, oh, Philip Yancey's in the next room. Would you go interview him, please? Now, Philip Yancey's an American author who sold millions of books. And I was totally unprepared for the interview, and I had no idea what to do. <laughs> this, is where, this is where faith really comes in handy sometimes. So I, uh, I grab my pad and I think, on my way to the next room, what do I ask Philip Yancey? I had no idea. Now this man has been over-interviewed. He's, he's pretty famous. Um, he has been asked many, many questions and interviewed many, many times. So I thought, what hasn't this guy been asked? And then I thought, well, that's what I'll ask him. So I asked Philip Yancey, my lead question was, may I ask, and that's always a good thing to say when you're interviewing people, is may I ask? Be unfailingly polite when you interview or deal with the public because you have the power. Somebody remind me later to, to say something about that. May I ask, um, in all the interviews you've had, what have you not been asked that you wish you had been asked? And he said to me, no one's ever asked me that question, which was great. He said, that's a great question. And I felt pretty good. I thought I earned my pay that day. And he said, no one has ever asked me um, the role classical music played in the formation of my faith. So I said, well, that's interesting. How did it play? And he told me a whole long story on how classical music proved to him that there was a God. Because in his mind, you couldn't have the organization of classical music without order in the universe. I mean, it was, uh, it was obvious to him. And that was his moment of revelation. Made for a great story. And so I started asking people that all the time. And I mentioned some of the people. That, the people I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Cal Thomas and um, Toby Mack and those people, I would just ask them that question as well. People that have been over-interviewed, um, you'll get a shot at them. Repeat it. Mm, oh, repeat it. Uh, um, what I asked them? Yeah, in all the interviews you've ever had. Uh, Toby Mack and uh, just, those just people. The question, so we can write it down. The question is, uh, what have you not been asked that you wish you had been asked? What have you never been asked that you'd wish you'd been asked? It's a refreshing question. And uh, they can talk off the top of their heads because they get tired of rote questions as well. They get the same questions all the time. OK, I want to talk to you about um, an interview I did with, um, I was in Texas in the United States when Hurricane Katrina hit the city of New Orleans. And there were refugees coming up out of New Orleans. And um, my assignment was to go interview these refugees at these Red Cross centers. And I want to read to you an interview that I had and explain to you how important it is to keep asking questions. Now, for all of you reporters everywhere, just keep asking questions. Go as deep as you can. Be unfailingly polite. Say, may I ask? Because these are personal questions you're asking somebody. And um, here's how this interview went. Um, I'm going to read it like this. Now, if you follow this, you're going to have some pretty interesting results. I asked, what happened to you? Now, I'm at a Red Cross Center, and he's uh, sitting in a chair with all his belongings beside him and his family's belonging on the floor of a gymnasium. And he said, my house and everything I own was taken away by the hurricane. All my family, mementos and pictures, and all my furniture are gone, all of it. Now, I could have stopped there as a reporter. I could have cut right there, or as a filmmaker, as a documentary filmmaker, you say, cut, great, we have it. He lost everything. And move on. Or you could ask the next question. So the next question I asked was, 
well, how are you getting through the pain of that loss? Pretty painful. And he said, well, losing everything made me realize that the most important thing in my life is my family. My family survived. That is what matters most. Well, you could cut right there. You could, as a print reporter or documentarian, you say, cut, great, we got our piece. Uh, that's what matters most, family, and go and report. But I asked another a question. I was, getting, I was trying to get at his worldview. Where does his ideas come from? And that's what you want to do with people. You want to get to say, where did you get this idea, how you're living? So I said, well, where does that perspective in life come from that family matters most? And he said, probably from my parents. We used to pray all the time when I was growing up. Now is the time to find out if all that praying we did in our, all our lives took hold. That's pretty interesting. His parents were praying parents. And so his worldview has to do with um, praying all the time. And did it take hold of my life? Well, I could have cut there and said, great, we have our footage or we have our, our print. Let's write our story. But I asked another question. I said, and what have you been praying, may I ask? Oh, I said, have you been praying uh, in these tough times? And he said, all the time. I never stopped. And I said, and what have you been praying, may I ask? And he said, for strength in God's thoughts, for patience and be able to come through this without being discouraged or giving up. So that's a pretty good comment. Strength, God's thoughts, don't be discouraged, don't give up. I could have said, cut, let's, you know, we've got the story, we've got great coats there, I've got to, I'm going to stop here. But I asked another question and I said, has that been working for you? Okay, so he's doing it, so what? And he said, really well, actually, even though I'm a thousand miles from home, God has provided me with shelter. And he pointed to this humble floor with all this stuff on it and food, and my family is together. I've never felt closer to God than I do right now, even though all these bad things have happened. I don't have a job. My house is probably underwater, but I really feel like he's going to get me through this. Wow, what a great quote. And I said, could have said, cut. We've got it. Great quote. Let's, you know, wrap. It's a wrap. Let's move on. But I said another question. Why do you think that? And he said, well, because this is a real interview. He said, because in all my life, in tough times, God has always been there for me and my family. This is just another tough time, and I know from the past that God will work something out. God always works something out. Well, how much more can you get? I mean, what a great, I mean, boy, what a faith story. What a, you know, it's a God story. And it's, a, and it's journalism. It's how he's handling disaster. And when you, when you interview people that have gone through disaster, ask them how they're getting through it. Ask them what in the world sustained you while you were in that mine, trapped in that mine, or your house has been washed away, or your family was killed by a rival tribe, or you know, there was war in your, your zone. What sustained you through that? So I asked one more question. He said, God will always work something out. And I said, why do you think God lets you go through tough times? I'm asking him for his opinion. I'm not saying... I'm not saying, any, I'm not making a declaration. I'm asking for his thoughts. Why do you think God lets you go through tough times? It's a pretty deep question. You don't see it in print or even in documentaries that often. The question is, why do, why do, the, why do I mind suffering? Yeah. And the bigger question is, why do the innocent suffer? Huge question. All I'm doing is asking him for his perspective. And this is what he said. Well, one thing, I can help other people better when I know what they're going through, because I know how hard it is for me. I can't even imagine going through a disaster like this without God. I don't know how people do it. It makes me want to help them understand. Losing everything can be devastating if that's all you have or things. You can't live life holding on to things as if that's all you have. One, because one day a hurricane is going to come by and take it all away. Wow. What a great quote. One day a hurricane's gonna come by and take it all away. Well, that was my pull quote for the section front. Had a picture of the guy, Hurricane Katrina, and the quote, big letters, one day a hurricane's gonna come by and take it all away. And that was my pull quote. That's the last thing he said. And I never would have gotten that quote if I just hadn't keep asking questions. Now, it doesn't cost you anything to ask a lot of questions. All it costs is time. Digital memory is being what it is. It's, it's, it's you know, it doesn't even cost anything anymore. Stretch your interview out. Have a coffee conversation with people. Get them to relax. Just listen to what they have to say. 
and keep asking questions. And the very last thing will be the thing you'll put up at the front of your story. It's happened to me so many times, it's ridiculous. What a great thing. One day a hurricane is going to come by and take it all the day. Now, let's look at this for a second. How many times is the words, this is not a religion story. This is a new story. It's just a story. Okay, but the questions I asked drew out an aspect of the story of how this person is surviving. I'm off my page here. There's not, I had a list of, thing, of things that weren't in there. There's not, oh, here it is. Here are the words that are not in this story. Um, Bible, pray, demon, angel, church, Jesus, Father, Son, Mary, nothing. None of that's in there. None of, those, none of those words are in that quote that I just read to you. But it's unmistakable that the man has faith in God and believes that God is going to watch out after him. And it's part of the story because he said it. I didn't make it up. It's there. People want to know that would be on the front page of USA Today or anyone else if, if he said it because those type of stories are acceptable now. And um, it was on the front page of the Tyler Marine Telegraph. Thing. There's sort of a, Deborah Bunting was talking about some video um, sayings that uh, are common and one of them is you're only, you're only as good as your last edit or your last project. Another one is that with all the materials, you gather as many materials as you can, any quotes as you can, and you have the opportunity not to use it. You can look at it and go, no, I don't want to do it. But if you don't have the quote, you can't use it. Because you can only quote. You have to keep your voice out of it. Because we're not advocates. We can't add a sentence to that. What a wonderful perspective of this man to have of, of God. It's so faithful and inspiring. You can't write that. This is not a column. This is a news piece. But if he says the things that he said, you can quote it and you put it in quotes because we're journalists, we're not advocates, we're observers. Okay, are there any questions on this? Yes? Are there any questions that you would never ask? Are there any questions that I would never ask? Well, um, I, don't, I don't go into, I don't go in ask, with the thought of asking any contentious questions. Um, I don't ever think about Asking them if they if I know they have enmity to somebody else, tell me about that. You know, I know you've had an argument with this person. Tell me about that. Get, give me the dirt. You know, let me in on that. I just avoid that because I don't find it helpful. So I ask questions that would lead to um, principles that I consider important, which are peace and reconciliation, uh, inspiration, building up, uh, healing, forgiveness, and away from acrimony, bitterness, accusation, greed, uh, envy, yeah, anger. Because people will use you. If you give people an opportunity to get back at somebody else, they'll use you to do it. And now you're a channel. You're being a conduit for someone else's condemnation. And I wouldn't do that. OK, any other questions? All right. What's the best story? When the people read, but I added something to that too. What you think is interesting. The best story are two things. What you think is interesting, and that will be a story that people will read. So with all you grassroots news people, let me encourage you, wherever you are in the world, if you find it interesting, somebody else in the world is going to find it interesting as well. Trust your intuition, take your time, check your facts, be accurate, and keep asking questions.